Section 7 of Movies and Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aidan Brack. The Punishment That Fitted the Crime by Stanley J. Fay. It may as well be explained at the beginning as at the end that it was only a dream. You would have guessed it anyhow. One morning, after a criminally reckless supper, the leading actor found himself in a police court and in the dock. How he came there he did not know, but what concerned him most at the time was the distressing fact that he was clothed only in his pyjamas. All at once he became aware that the magistrate was addressing him. "'You are charged,' he was saying, "'with an offence under the Publicity Act, 1910. "'One of the provisions of that Act, I may remind you, "'makes it a misdemeanour for any man, woman, or child "'resident in the United Kingdom "'to be interviewed for the press more frequently than once a month, "'and in prescribing the appropriate penalty.' The Act directs that such incidents as photographs, bon mots, and domestic touches shall be held to constitute an aggravation of the offence. Now it has been proved against you that you have caused or allowed interviews with yourself to appear in no fewer than five different papers during the past week. In one of these, which I single out as providing the most flagrant breach of the Act, you are shown pictorially in various attitudes and occupations. In your study, in your garden, in your motor car, and so forth. I have no doubt in my own mind that this is precisely the kind of abuse at which the act was intended to strike, and I am therefore resolved to make an example of your case, and to inflict the maximum penalty the law allows. Seven days cinematograph. Take him away. He was led from the dock by a couple of vicious policemen. But instead of being conducted to the cells as he had expected, he was pushed with much unnecessary violence into the street. Once outside the court, he did not stay to speculate upon the meaning of his apparent liberty, but rushed towards his home, pursued all the way by a jeering crowd that found infinite satisfaction and food for wit in the composition of his limited attire. And above the shouting of the mob, he could hear, as he ran, a curious buzzing noise, bringing back vague recollections which he could not track to their source. How he finally arrived home and got through the business of the day, he could not afterwards remember. But he was conscious that whatever he did, and wherever he went, there was still that elusive buzzing, and occasionally a blinding light that filled him with a nameless terror. In the evening the two vicious policemen called for him again, and intimated that he must accompany them. This time the entire town seemed to have turned out to witness his humiliating progress through the streets. And still that buzzing noise. And again that blinding light. He found himself seated in the centre of a large and crowded place of entertainment, evidently a music hall. A couple of comic acrobats were just finishing their turn, and then the lights suddenly went out, and a cinematograph performance began. But in place of the customary pictures of winter sports in Switzerland, or racing motorboats, there appeared on screen a crowd gathered expectantly outside a sombre-looking building. Presently the doors of the building opened, and two dark-coated figures were seen gripping a miserable, flimsily clad, great heavens, it was himself. A sweat of agony broke over him as he saw the scene of the morning enacted again, the panic flight, the scanty garb, the jeering mob, but worse followed. Upon the screen was thrown the legend, scenes from the home life of an actor, and there he saw himself playing the leading part in a succession of intimately domestic episodes. In one he was quarrelling with his wife, in another he was having his hair waved, 
In a third he was being fitted with a pair of corsets. And then he remembered and understood the sentence that the magistrate had passed upon him. And with a further shock he realized it still had six days to run. He stood up and blasphemed. Instantly lights were flashed from all parts of the house and upon his wild gesticulations was turned the lens of a huge cinematographic camera. He sought to cover up his face, but rough hands. He awoke to find that a light was actually being flashed in his eyes. Fresh from his terror, and believing his dream to have been real, he cried out, Don't take me again! I'll give you anything, but don't take me again! I ain't come to take you! replied a hoarse voice. I've come to take your valuables. Where'd you keep them? Then you're not the cinematograph man? Thank heaven. Take what you like. And from sheer relief, he fainted. A few days later, the leading actor delivered his presidential address at the annual meeting of the Stage Improvement Association. He chose as his theme, The Evils of Publicity, and afterwards gave interviews on the subject to three newspaper representatives. End of section seven.